Welcome to Transformational Pathways, a podcast created by Toastmasters District 46 in the greater New York area, where we share conversations from influencers within the Toastmasters community and people whose lives have positively transformed by walking down the Toastmasters path. Whether you're just getting started in your career, have had recent career changes, or you're navigating different languages, we're here to help you build confidence by discovering new tools, overcoming your fears to find your voice, and engaging in a thriving community. Enjoy today's episode. Hello! Welcome to another episode of Toastmasters District 46 Transformational Pathways Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Mason, and walking the pathway with us today is our guest, Natsuyo Lipshut. Natsuyo is the managing principal of the strategy consulting firm, Aspire Intelligence. She is also an executive consultant for Breakthrough Speaking, a global speaking consultancy. In addition, Natsuyo is the best-selling author of The Success Blueprint, which she co-wrote with world-famous business speaker, Brian Tracy. As if that weren't enough. She is also the author of Amazon Japan's number one rated presentation book, Say It in 20 Words. Natsuyo is a TEDx speaker who is also a five times Toastmasters New York International Speech Contest district finalist. I'm scared even sitting here. Now, Suyo, there's a lot to you. I'll also add that you're a competitive Latin dancer and a mom. Is there anything you don't do? Not Suyo, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. That was quite an intro. <laughs> I'm you know, so excited to be here, Scott. It is an honor to have you. I'm going to start with a little story. So, a couple of years ago, I rode my little bicycle from Manhattan into Queens and I rode to one of the Riverside parks and there was this brand new library there where there was a special Toastmasters event and it had the best speakers in the whole district featured. And as I was watching speaker after speaker and I was, my, the, my lower jaw was actually hurting because it kept hitting the floor after dropping and seeing all these people, someone really special came up on the stage and she gave An incredible speech with a style all her own. It was calm yet warm, charismatic without being over dramatic. And she also incorporated dance into her speech. And not Suyo. Well, I wonder who that is. Who might that? (laughs) I never forgot who that person was. You may not remember this, but a little while later, I saw you at National Speakers Association, introduced myself as a total stranger, got you on LinkedIn, and have been ecstatic that as a Toastmaster and someone who shares some other professional affiliations with you, I finally get to interview this woman who made such an impression on me. Natsuyo, I am so excited, and I recommend anyone who is watching this podcast or listening to it to find your website or find a way to watch you speak, because you are extraordinary. Wow. Thank you. I didn't even realize you were there in the audience. I know. That's the privilege of being a superstar. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> gets to know you, and you're like, oh, who are well, you? They know me, but I don't know your name. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. A lot more people are going to know about you today, and I'm excited to tell them about you. Not uh, Sue, yo. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit. Are you from New York? How did you end up in this world? No. Well, I was born and raised in Japan, and I came, I actually landed in New York accidentally. What? (laughs) Yeah. When I was in junior, in in college, back in 1993, uh, just revealed my age, but (laughs) um, I was an exchange student to Washington University in St. Louis. So I spent one year there. And, And there, I got to know something called MBA. (laughs) <laughs> and I got interested and I thought, wow, I want to I, I wanna go to an MBA program in the future. And after one year, I went back to Japan and I called up one of the uh, famous MBA schools admissions office. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I'm interested in your, your, your MBA program. How do I get in? So you just <laughs> randomly said, called them up? 
I just randomly uh, called. How did they, I bet they've never had anything like that happen in their lives. How did they even respond? I know. I, I said, well, I'm calling from Japan. I'm interested in your program. And can you tell me how I can get in? <laughs> And I mean, thinking back, I'm like, oh god! I love it. Know. Fortune favors the bold. You were bold. I was. I was. I don't. I don't know. I was so <laughs> young, right? I wouldn't do that now. <laughs> and then they told me, "Oh, do you have any work experience?" I said, "No, I'm a student." And then, and then they said, "Then、um, have at least three years of work experience,、mm. and then you can apply."、Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Wow." There, there, there are schools that you have to be working already. Wow!、Yeah. And I, I thought you go to school because you, 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 you haven't worked yet. Yeah. And like, okay, wow. Then I gotta, I gotta have some work experience. And long story short, um, I had an opportunity to meet with the CEO of a, a big Japanese trading company, and Mr. Che, and he was a CEO of the New York, um. The arm of this company,、mm -hmm. and he was visiting Japan, and I got to meet him over breakfast. He was a busy man, so I only had about an hour at 7 a.m. at one of the hotels in Tokyo, and we were chatting about all kinds of things. And at the end, he said, "So, are you interested in coming to the States?" And I said, "Yes." And I and and, and then he said,、uh, "Where where would you like to go?" And I said,、hmm, "Chicago. Oh、uh, no, you're in New York, Mr. Che. So New York." And then he said, "New York, it is. Welcome to my company." I'm like, Whoa. "Oh, okay.、Uh, thank you." <laughs> okay, wait. I, I just have to interject myself here. Usually, I like to let guests finish their story, but that ain't happening this time. Let's let's go back a little bit. I want to know more about your background in Japan because I, look, I grew up in the wheat fields of Kansas, and and to me. And、my mom worked in a dog food factory, so the idea of just like calling someone up and having lunch with the CEO of a, of the foreign of a New York division of a so, multinational、so. is a little bit beyond my mind's ability to man. Talk to us a little bit about where were you from in Japan? What was your family like? <laughs> Who were these people that raised you? <laughs> okay,、um, well, I was born and raised in Tokyo,、yeah. Tokyo, Japan, and my mom was a single mom, even though、wow. my dad. Showed up.、Uh, I mean, he 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 was there all the time. I am, amazing thing about my parents is that they didn't make me even doubt that you know my my father my parents weren't married.、Mm -hmm. So my father was there all、mm -hmm. the time, almost every day, and he was. He he passed away、uh, years ago.、Uh, so my late father, thank you.、Uh, my late father was a, a founder and president, and and later CEO of this automotive company. Oh wow!、Um, and people in the auto auto industry know him quite well. Right, right. right.、Um, so he was a very busy man. He was traveling all all the time, and he was running the company in a global business. So he didn't have time yet. He always came. To my house for dinner. Wow! If he had ten minutes, he would come stop at、oh. our, our, our house. So I didn't know about my family situation until when I was nineteen. I clearly remember the day when my mom sat me after I came back from school, and she said, "Well." Your father was just awarded this amazing award from the Emperor Showa,、oh、and、God. he decided he decided to take this opportunity, a good time, to tell you that he has another family. And I said, "Okay." And we are married. Oh, and that was it. And then about thirty minutes later, my my dad came home, looking really anxious and、yeah. really anticipated. And I can't forget his face when I opened the door. It was this awkwardness and everything, anticipation in his face. Yeah, yeah. And I said, "Hi, Dad." Yeah. And then I went to my、um, I went to my room later that night. 
And for the first time, and one just just that one time, I cried yeah, I because I didn't know how to process the information. Yeah. But he was always there, so that's all it mattered to me. Yeah. So, my mom told me really well that the most important thing is that you have a fa- family together. Not it, it. It doesn't matter what the legal status is,、yeah. but your father was always there. But I have to ask because this is not our society, America's society. Is there any stigma associated associated、yeah. with that? And and like, how did you begin to deal with that? I I I can't even imagine processing something like that. And it's easy to say, especially in hindsight, family matters and they're there for you. But、uh, yeah, well, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, it, what? How did you even begin? Affect to- me. Su- su- surpri- surprisingly, it didn't affect me because. I mean, the legal status didn't really matter to me.、Mm-hmm. My both both of my parents were there, always there for me. So I had my father and and mother. You know, even a, a lot of single single parent families are not that fortunate to have、mm-hmm. both parents present, right?、Yeah. But I had that.、Um, you know, I I I I had that,、um, but. It was my mom who had to go through a lot of、oh. stigma、mm. um, because she she really didn't want me to be bullied or ridiculed because、oh. yeah. I'm I, I'm a sing, single mom's child.、Yeah. So she tried to give me every possible best things,、mm. whatever it is,、uh, whether、mm. it's academics or ballet school or. Uh, things I wear or whatever, she、mm-hmm. tried to get to, to give me the best of everything. So I was very fortunate. Sounds like it. There's nothing like a mother's love. I'll tell you. Yeah. Except maybe the love of your Toastmasters family, but even that doesn't quite <laughs> measure up to mom. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a little while, though. Yeah, yeah mothers are amazing. They、yeah. really are. Now I have to ask you: Did you learn English growing up then, or or、uh, was that something that came? Until- Well, not not until I.、Um, well, actually, I I always liked English, and my being because my father was a、uh, was was traveling all over the world. He would come, he, you know, he would come home with these stamps from France, coins <laughs> from England, you know, all these little little things. And I was always interested in、um, out as outside of Japan.、Mm-hmm. So English was、uh, one of my interests. So when I was in junior high school,、um, every Japanese person knows this, but、uh, there is a、um, English radio program.、Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, back then radios used to be, you know, not on the internet. You know,、right. something you switch on, and then you know. <laughs>、um, so there, there was a twenty-minute program every single day, and I would listen to it every day. And when I wasn't home on time, I would ask my mom to record it with a cassette tape.、Oh. I was listening to it every single day. And when I was in college, I went to、uh, English conversation school.、Um, but that was pretty much it. And then it wasn't until when I was an exchange student in St. Louis when I I was really immersed into this American、right. culture. Gotcha. So you had a breakfast with the divisional CEO of an international company that obviously wasn't a complete disaster. You get a job in New York City. What are you doing there, and, and what is that like for you coming from Japan to New York City? I mean, New York is smaller than where you're from, so I, there's not the usual. Oh, I was overwhelmed by all the lights and all that sort of stuff. But talk to me a little bit about how you felt coming here and what that first job was like. Yeah, well, my first job was、uh, um, the sales assistant in steel department,、mm. the steel industry,、uh, so hardcore stuff.、Um, but when when I first landed in New York, my first impression was, "What a loud city!" <laughs> I'm proud And, of that, by the way. <laughs> I'm proud, 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 proud of that now. <laughs> But, you know, 
you know, I, I consider myself a New Yorker now. <laughs> but back then, I was so surprised that, oh, I'm going to bed and, and, and there, there's so much noise out there, beeping sound and, you know, sirens and all that. And does the city ever stop? No, it doesn't. <laughs> That's what makes New York great, you exactly. know? And uh, so first, it was a fascination. And then I started to to notice the differences in culture and communication, especially um, the way I'm used to, I, I was used to speaking wasn't clear enough or wasn't mm. convincing enough. What do you mean? So I had to relearn how to speak. Talk to me a little bit more about uh, uh, how, how did that manifest itself? Like, what would people have said about you if you were to have been eavesdropping on them? Well, for, for example, uh, Jap, Jap, Japanese way of communication is really, really indirect. And, mm -hmm. and we don't want to say much. Mm -hmm. And we expect the other person to, to guess what you're trying to say mm -hmm. so that it doesn't, have, it doesn't sound too direct. Mm -hmm. And also, we're not too aggressive, a little more reserved. Mm -hmm. And you don't really project your opinion right away, mm. right in your face. Wow. Um, and, and the typical New York moment is that when, when, I, when I went to get lunch, uh, I, I went to a deli and I wanted, you know, I, I was browsing and I wanted to decide, you know, okay, which, which one am I, am I going to order? It was my turn. And I was still thinking, oh, um, well, I would, I would like to, have, what, what, what is it? Next, next. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I gotta be quick. I, I gotta be direct, and mm. I have to, I have to decide really quickly. And I couldn't be talking for a long time. I I, I needed to be pimp, really direct, to the point, and succinct, whatever, and and just just tell tell them what you want. Yes, and and then you get what you want. Otherwise, you're not gonna get what you want. Yeah, yeah, right. You're not heard. Right. Yes. And then later, probably about five to seven years in, uh, my communication style became way too direct. And from the Japanese people's perspectives, I became Americanized. Oh. So I had to readjust my communication. Well, talk to me a little bit about First of all, were you too direct from a New York perspective, right? Were you fitting in so well that people would have never guessed that you were not from here? And then you come back home and all of a sudden they feel like, a, you know, they're looking at you and a, a cannon's coming their way. Or, or was it too direct even for New York? I guess I was fitting in to a New York <laughs> standard. <laughs> but, but sometimes the interesting thing about cross-cultural issues is that you need to be you need to be flexible you can't mm -hmm. be far right or far left or you know, left or right i i don't know uh, whatever you call it They're far to one end mm. and far to the other end but you need to you need to be able to gauge where the other person is and in relative to where you are and then how you want to adjust yourself so that you're not only heard but your message is acted upon Fascinating point, and it is a recurring theme in this podcast. We're going to come back to you, actually, because your twist on it is different than we've explored before. I'm going to, though, just so the audience members and you and I both can be triggered at the same time, put that in the bucket of reading the audience, reading mm -hmm. who we're talking to. Yep. Let's, though, before we go there... Was that what led you into Toastmasters? How did you end up involved in Toastmasters? Yeah, Toastmasters. I, I've been a Toastmaster since 2010. And when I was in MBA program at New York, New York University Stern School of Business, I had to give presentations, obviously. And back then, I hated presenting. Oh, really? Es yeah, especially in English. Mm -hmm. It was hard. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was hard for me. And I didn't grow up speaking in front of people. That's not how 
the traditional Japanese education was uh, was was done. So I wasn't used to speaking in front of people and not alone in another language. Wow! So yeah, yeah. I used to pick the shortest segment. I, I would volunteer to pick the shortest segment, memorize everything, and wow. I just say what, what I memorized and I exited. Wow! And, Q&A, and when the, when the Q and A came, it was like. Uh, you, um, Steve. <laughs> I would not answer because I I didn't prepare uh, for mm-hmm. the impromptu. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, okay, something's gotta be done. And I think it was Toastmasters. Uh, w- w- when I think back now, there was some kind of club at Stern School of Business, and I and I joined. I mean, I I I went to. Their meeting once, and they gave me some. I think it was a table topic speech、yeah. topic, and I froze and I couldn't say anything,、really? and I hated it. So I never went back. And、wow. after I graduated from MBA, and I went into the real world, I I, I was so determined that I really need to improve my speaking skill,、yeah. and I researched, and then Toastmasters came up. And I visited the open house, and it was a Nichibei Toastmasters. It's a Japanese American or Japanese and English bilingual club,、mm-hmm. and I felt comfortable because there were a bunch of Japanese people there trying to speak better in English. So I decided to join, and that was back in two thousand ten. Fascinating. And, yeah, and the rest re- rest is a history. Well, maybe not exactly. Glossed over that easily because you've done a lot and you have been on an incredible journey. Let's talk about competitive speaking in a Toastmasters、mm. context. One of the things that I really was unaware of, as a thing that even existed before I joined Toastmasters, was that there are these contests, and the Toastmasters listening to this will know exactly what I'm talking about. But I want to direct this part of the discussion from an explanatory perspective to those who are listening or watching who might not be Toastmasters yet. I didn't know that there was this whole world of competitive speaking out there, sort of dominated by Toastmasters, and that people would learn these speeches and they would go on international stages and they would do local, highly localized ones, and ones for the entire area that they were in, and then the region, and this, that, and the other. And I'll never forget going to my first international convention, being blown away by these people. But that being said, I will. I have to admit, not all areas of the world are the same. There is so much talent in New York City、yeah. that, having observed speakers that have participated in contests, the abundance here and is so high that even at the district level or the area level, you would see people that, in my opinion, were every bit as engaging and compelling as at the international level. It's just that only one、yeah. person can always escalate and move、yeah. up every time. So all of these incredible、right. people I mean, are being weeded out. Yeah, and and just, I just put like you in abso- other industry in New York, right?、Like、yeah, they're, they're they're always top level, top notch people in New York. And that goes as to the story I said at the very beginning of the hour about the impression that you made on me, which was favorable to many people that I have seen at the international contest. Not to diminish any of our international winners, they obviously can hold their own against anyone in the world. They would be the winners, but we have a lot going on here. So, did you know that there was there was this whole world of contests going on, and one day you'd be participating five times in these contests and going up to the district? I, I, by the way, I'll tell you, I competed. I didn't even make it past the area. I think I was three out of four. So,、uh, congratulations to you. What? what? What happened? What, what were you doing? You were afraid to、yeah. talk in front of your class, and next thing you know, you're in competitions. Come on. Yeah. Well, the first time I competed was just because the the club told me to.、Oh, what? <laughs> yeah, the club said, "Well, there there is a competition." I'm like, "What competition of what?、Like、speech competition, obviously." And okay, and we need contestants, so you compete. I'm like, okay. So I didn't know what it was, and and I competed, and I won the the club, and I'm like, okay, and I'm moving on to what is it area? Okay,、um, and then I competed, and and at that time I met someone. Her name is Janice. Some of you may know. 
uh, in District 46, Janice was sitting all the way at the end. Mm. And at the end of the contest, she came up to me and said, Hi, I'm Janice. You have a potential. Let me coach you if you want to move on. Wow. And I said, Wow, free coaching. Great. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have my speech done already, so I just have to practice with this person. I was dead wrong. <laughs> the first time she coached me, I, I can't, I can't forget. I was in the conference room around 6 p.m., I think, and everyone was pretty much gone for the day. And I, we, we, we did the run, run through. And the first thing she said was, you have multiple messages. I hear mm. this, I hear that, and I hear that. What is it that you really want to focus on? Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, I thought I tried to jam everything I wanted to say into one speech because I, I only got five to seven minutes. Yeah. So I have to say everything. And she said, no, get rid of unnecessary stuff and just focus on one message. Mm. And that's how I came mm -hmm. up with the, the concept that, that, that I teach at Breakthrough Speaking, one big message. Always focus on one big message. And I learned that from Janice. And then she con continued on. And we were practicing and she said, okay, you, you just said surprised, but I didn't feel that you were surprised. Mm -hmm. How surprised were you? Was mm -hmm. it a pleasant surprise or sad surprise or or out of the blue, uh, you know, it, it blew your mind. And what kind of surprise was it? Right. Show that in, in one word. And I thought, wow, this is about performance. Mm -hmm. And I was always a dancer. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, I mean, I, I, I always loved performing, performing arts. But I always thought that performing arts and business don't merge. Mm -hmm. But that moment, I, I, I figured out that, oh, speaking is a, a, an entertainment. And you have, to, you have to be able to entertain the listeners so that they will really hear you and act on your message. So when I learned that, I felt, wow, speaking is interesting. Mm -hmm. And I want to learn more. Mm -hmm. And then I started to compete every year, and I also uh, took the certification course, the, the speech coaching certification mm -hmm. course, and then um, and I read so many books, attended uh, boot camps, and uh, it, it 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 really felt that public speaking is a such a dynamic process, uh, dy dynamic form of art. I love that you're describing it as art. Someone who coaches me once told me, Scott, you are a creative artist. The medium that you use is speech. And what you do through that story is not only fully integrate that, but you also bring multi uh, forms of art into your speech. Again, as the dancing that you mentioned, that we mentioned at the top of the hour that you actually integrate into your speech. It's a standout moment. It's unforgettable. Talking about that as well as the singularity of a message takes me to another question that I have for you. The whole reason I participated in the contest was a longtime Toastmaster who was in my club told us that those who participate in contests benefit from it through the contest process itself, even if you don't do well. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I think when, when you have a certain goal, that's when you really put your best effort in and try to improve yourself. So going through the process of competitions, even if you don't win, you read through your script over and over, you rewrite and improve. And that's, you know, that, that's how you improve yourself. And the con, you know, ju judges are human. And it, you know, if, if you don't win, well, that doesn't mean you're, you're a bad speaker. Yeah. It, it just, it, it just happened to be that the judges preferred another speaker. Absolutely. That's all. 
but it's the process of improving yourself, improving your speech that、uh, grows you as a person. Yeah, I, 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 I'm saying grows you as a person because I really believe the speech writing process is about self impro- improvement or self development. Because when you craft a story, you really have to go in deeper into yourself, deep into your past, and really have a deep understanding of why you did. What you did and what was your learning, and when you tell a story to other people, you learn about yourself too,、yeah. and you grow as a person. And do you have an example of how that happened with you during your own speech writing process? Yeah, well, every speech writing process、uh, was a, a a journey for growth, but one speech. I was writing about, which actually led me to become a professional speaker, is that back in 2017, I was I was preparing for my my speech contest, the club contest, the very first one, and it was February 6th, the day before my club contest. I got a phone call from my doctor, and I found out that I had breast cancer. And that was one day before my club contest. And at that time, my daughter was five years old,、mm-hmm. and it was a heavy snow day. So she was off from school because she 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 had snow day,、mm-hmm. and we were preparing to go sledding with 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 our、mm-hmm. friends, and we were getting ready, putting the 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 ski gear on、uh, or snow gear on, and then my cell phone rang. And and the doctor said we found cancer. Oh my god! And I was holding my phone,、yeah. and I was holding my daughter's hand, and my daughter had no idea. She just she was just excited to go sledding.、Yeah. I couldn't react. Oh my god! So I I just took it in. I said, okay. What's the next step? And the next step was、uh, to do a little more exams,、mm-hmm. like、uh, CT scan and stuff, right?、Um, and I said, "Okay, I will make an appointment." And I hung up. And of course, all kinds of thoughts were going in my head. Yeah, of course. And I, it, it felt like a whole hour, but it was prob- probably about a few seconds.、Mm-hmm. I just took a deep breath and turned to my daughter and I said, "Oh, let's go sledding."、Yeah. And we went sledding. We had fun. I have a video、uh, of that moment too. And then I went home that night, and we were watching TV and some some kids show, and 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 my daughter Lena was. Laughing at TV, and I was looking out the window, and and there are many s- stars in the sky that day.、It、was a clear night, and all of a sudden, that those stars w- looked like cancer cells in my breast, all spread、oh, out,、wow. and I started crying.、Oh. Yeah. But it was it was that moment. Only that moment when I cried in front of my daughter. But my daughter said, "Oh, does something hurt?" And I said, "No." And I love you. And her response was, "I love me too." <laughs> okay. Well, she senses. Something was going on, and she tried、yeah. to make me laugh.、Yeah. And at that moment, I thought, "I gotta be strong for this girl,、yeah. and I'm gonna and 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 I. It's 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 okay to be vulnerable,、yeah. but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let this vulnerability take over me、mm-hmm. because I have this girl. I have to I have to protect、the、mother's love.、Again. And the second, yeah, and the second thing I thought was. This is a great speaking topic, <laughs> and then I I surprised myself. 
wow, I'm thinking this way. I must be a storyteller.、Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm going to compete tomorrow. I'm not going to quit because I want to tell my story.、Yeah. So for, for the club contest, I, I, I stuck with my original content, but area contest, I switched my story、mm-hmm. to a breast cancer story. And I shared my story, and I felt like, I really felt like through stories, I can connect with the audience、yeah. heart to heart. And speaking was healing for me.、Mm-hmm. So it, telling a story healed me.、Mm-hmm. And also, it healed the audience too. Whatever they were feeling, whatever pain they had.、Yeah. So at that moment, I, I, I felt that speaking is healing. And I felt I, I, I became a more authentic speaker, I guess,、mm-hmm. and stronger as a person. So going back to the personal development, I learned to be authentic and brave enough to be vulnerable and connect. With the audience. Thank you for that. And I just want to let you know that you demonstrated it in real time right here, and I'm feeling it myself.、Um, I'm, I'm feeling it. I really am. Thank you. Thank you. So. You, don't cry, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. I might. <laughs> That's okay. We all have to learn how to have, I, I, you know, part of what I love about Toastmasters, this podcast, but Toastmasters generally, is there are so many people that are amazing. And because of what you're talking about, the understanding that vulnerability is how we bring out our best selves as speakers, you develop connections with people. And you shared something intimate about yourself. And I, as a listener, Felt connected to you, not just as a talking head or someone passing on information, but as a human being. And that's where the feelings inside come out. It's a genuine connection. There's real power there. And like you said, I may, and someone listening to this or, or watching to this, watching this down the road may be in that exact same situation one day. And that story that you just shared that may have made their eyes moist. May emotionally resonate with them and that could change someone's life. It could make, it, the will to live is so much of what living is about and that might help someone have that little will to live. Yeah, yeah. And, and when, when you tell a story like that, you know, it, it, the, the universal message really resonates with the audience. You know, the audience may not have breast cancer, but, you know, they, they, but, but they may have some other You know, difficult situations, hard, hard situations, some pain points. And that's, that's what,、uh, that, 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 that's what really resonates,、uh, with the audience. But the, the breast cancer story is unique to my situation, but the message was, I believe, universal. And it's、uh, also important to understand, as I'm understanding you, that message isn't necessarily the story. The message is what the lesson is, or the. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, let's go back to reading the audience. Your firm is a global public speaking consultancy. And as you've talked about throughout this hour, you've dealt with some of the challenges that come with intercultural communication. Your own journey from. From a kitten into a tiger from a verbal performance or, or, or interaction or a speaking perspective. And my question for you is,、uh, well, is, is what you're talking about though universal? If I'm speaking to an audience in Saudi Arabia or Rwanda or Thailand or Australia,、uh, is that same vulnerability going to work? And do you have some tips? That people can take away who might be listening to this or watching as to how to translate the things that they learn from Toastmasters into intercultural communication settings. Yeah, definitely. I think the, the message itself is really universal.、Um, it doesn't matter what country you're from, everyone has hearts and everyone experience, experiences some hardship. So, 
when you when you find a universal message that resonates with everyone, anyone in the in the world.、Right. That being said, the way to deliver your story may be slightly different depending on who you're talking to, especially in different cultures,、um, such as Japan is a very different culture than America, and with the Japanese audience. Who tends to be a little more reserved and formalized? You need to warm them up、yeah. uh, a little more than, let's say, American audience. So the opening may be a little bit different. The opening may be a little more formalized and introduce yourself to establish relationship with、uh, the audience. And you may not make. Drastic jokes to make、mm-hmm. them laugh、mm-hmm. from the get go. When they're warm, you may you, you may use humor, but not may pro- possibly not from the very beginning.、Right. Whereas in in America, it's more direct communication type of culture compared to、uh, Asian countries.、Right. So you may you 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 may open with a cold open. So I I call it warm warm open and cold open. Warm open、uh, warm open will be something like, oh、uh, oh it it was, it was it's、uh, it's nice weather today and you know, and start talking about something light、yeah. and and gradually go into the content. But the cold opening will be going directly into your story. Back in two thousand seventeen, I was diagnosed、right. with breast cancer, something like that. So you can differentiate the opening, and then you work your way in to build、uh, trust and relationship with your audience,、mm-hmm. and then your story can be universal. Love it! I love it. This is an area that you have delved into extensively throughout your very impressive career. How can people find out more about you, what you do, and follow you generally? Yeah,、um, there are a few different ways to connect with me. And one is to go visit my website,、uh, natsuyolipshots.us, and you can find all about me and what I teach and what my、uh, my services are. And if you if you want to casually connect with me, I'm in LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram, and it'll be written somewhere. Yes, in the、there. show notes. <laughs> yep. So、um, just connect with me and like my SNS、uh, page, and and you'll you'll hear about my news and some speaking tips. And. Anyone who is smart enough to do that will be glad that they did so. Now we're going to close out with two questions that I ask every guest. Give me whatever answer you feel inside. Now, so you, I can't wait to hear who is your favorite leader, who is your favorite speaker, and why. Hmm. Okay. My favorite leader is my late father. Ah. Why? I guess obvious reason, but he he was such a true leader who was humble, and I, I think being humble is a, a, one of the most important qualities to be a, a leader. You、mm-hmm. can't be arrogant. You then people won't follow. And he was a very humble leader. Love it. Yet he achieved so many things. Like, but like I mentioned before, he won some award. He received an award from a, an emperor. Yeah, top that, leading... everybody! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 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 he he was the leader of the Japanese、uh, delegate at、uh, World Economic Forum. Wow!、Uh, one of one of those years. Oh my、yeah. gosh! Wow! So he 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 was such an accomplished. Businessman, and he also won an award in、uh, the performing arts for writing、uh, a show script. You're kidding! He was he was he was such a respected、wow. man, right? So he's my absolute hero, and my favorite favorite speaker. There are so many favorite speakers I have, but I love. Lisa Nichols, and tell us about she、her. is, yeah she is, she is、uh, talking about authenticity. 
you can feel her heart,、mm. and you can feel her emotion, and 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 what's going on inside of her in every single word she says. Wow! And she has such power, energy, warmth, and authenticity. And once she starts speaking, you're glued to her. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So, Lisa Nichols, check her out. Thank you so much for that. I may just have to, and I bet a bun- bunch of people who are watching or listening will as well. Natsuyo, it has been great having you on the show today. Thank you for joining us and sharing your story. Now, Thank you. For those of you who are listening or watching, if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review or comment. Also, don't forget to follow District Forty Six on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And if you're new to Toastmasters, check out Toastmasters46.org. That's Toastmasters46.org to learn more about us or to visit one of our clubs. Because Toastmasters is where leaders are made. Thank you so much for joining us on Transformational Pathways. If you enjoyed today's episode or got anything out of it, please rate, review, and subscribe. And if you're interested in learning more about Toastmasters District 46. Check out the link in the show notes below.